Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Yolanda Blair. I'm the curator for Moving Image at M+. Uh, thank you all for tuning in to our launch event for Touch for Luck, which is the inaugural M+ Facade Commission. I'd like to begin by thanking our supporter of tonight's talk, uh, the Consulate General of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Tonight, I am joined by my colleague, Kate Gu, uh, the producer of Digital Special Projects at M+. Um, and it will be a one hour conversation with the artists Luna Mara and Rule Valters of the Amsterdam based design studio Monica. Together we will discuss the concepts behind Touch for Luck, which is a brand new interactive work that's currently on display every night on the M plus facade. Uh, please note that while the discussion will be uh, conducted in English, uh, there is a Cantonese simultaneous interpretation available by simply clicking on the globe icon on the toolbar on Zoom. Uh, so next slide, please. Sorry. Um, so before we delve into Touch for Luck, I wanted to first give a brief introduction to the M Plus facade, particularly for those audiences that are joining us from outside of Hong Kong. Uh, the M Plus facade is an enormous public art screen uh, embedded into the architecture of the M Plus building. It measures 65 metres tall by 110 metres wide, making it one of the largest public screens in the world. It's made up of more than five and a half thousand LED tubes that are sandwiched in between the louvres um, that cover the building's tower. The different angles and intensities of the LEDs mean that the display can be viewed from various vantage points around Hong Kong, uh, as near as the M plus building entrance, which is pictured here, or as far away as Hong Kong Island, which is one and a half kilometres across Victoria Harbour. Next slide, please. The M plus facade is designed as an exhibition and a promotional space that helps bring the museum into a visual dialogue with the surrounding urban landscape and Hong Kong's famous skyline. While Hong Kong is of course renowned for its vibrant uh, and illuminated cityscape, what differentiates our screen is its focus on contemporary visual culture rather than advertising. The facade is active from six till 11 o'clock, 365 nights a year, during which time it presents and promotes the M plus collections, exhibitions and programs. Soon after we opened the museum on November 12, we began to display the first six of 20 collection highlight videos that are pictured here. And these are two minute videos that feature hundreds of objects currently on display at M plus. In the videos, these objects are organized thematically as well as through uh, visual cues. And they juxtapose objects from our three core disciplines being visual art, moving image and design and architecture. At the same time, uh, presenting a range of different histories, creative languages and perspectives on contemporary topics um, ranging from new technologies, mass production, global capitalism, uh, nature and ecology, Hong Kong urban culture, and much, much more. Next slide, please. One of our earliest facade screenings was Vincent Brocare's whimsical 10-part animation, How to Build a Museum, which creatively reimagines the way that the M Plus building came into being. This spe special commission appeared concurrently on the M Plus website and on our social media channels, as a way to pique audience interest in the lead up to the museum's opening. But tonight we're here to learn about Touch for Luck, which is the first artwork to be commissioned specifically for the idiosyncratic M plus facade and made by the Amsterdam based interactive design studio Monica. Monica is led by Luna Mora and Ruhl Valters. And with Monica, they explore the characteristics of technology, how people use it and how it influences our daily lives. Often the audience is asked to take part in the development of their projects. Monica has won several awards, including a British Music Video Award and several Dutch Design Awards. They've taught design and given workshops and lectures at some of the world's most prestigious universities, museums, conferences and festivals, including, but not limited to, uh, the Royal Academy of Art in the UK, uh, Yale University School of Art in the US, Google's SPAN conference, the Walker Art Centre in the US, and the International Graphic Design Biennale Brno in the Czech Republic, among others. 
And with that, I'm going to pass to Kate Gu, M Plus's producer of digital special projects and the key driver of this project uh, to introduce Touch for Luck. Thanks, Yolanda. Hi, everyone, I'm Kate. Um, so about Touch for Luck, the inaugural digital commission for the M Plus facade, um, it is an interactive digital artwork that prompt participants to reflect on phenomena associated with mobile phone usage and social media via a game. The objective of the game is to touch your phone screen without letting go. So once you go to touchforluck.com, you will first receive your avatar fish. You can touch and drag your fish to navigate and explore the pond, aka the word of luck. As you progress through the game, you will start to collect things called lucky charms, each of which comments on our everyday digital experience. These tokens of luck echo popular and addictive mechanisms designed to get you hooked onto social media. By getting the lucky charms, you can also unlock skills that allow you to interact with other fish. So of course, you can meet and play with the others who are simultaneously interacting and playing the game. And most importantly, your mobile phones are connected to the Mplus facade through live feeds, which means that there's a good chance that you can find your own fish on the facade, making the facade a digital meeting space. And for today's conversation, we're going to have a 10 minute Q&A session at the end. So I would like to invite our audiences to send us questions or comments in the Q&A box at the bottom right of the Zoom window at any time during the talk. And without further ado, Let's get started with today's conversation. An easy one to start with, uh, Luna and Rao. Can you please begin uh, by telling us the history of Monica? How did you two meet and start working together? Um, how did the studio come to be? Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, thank you for inviting us here for the artist talk. So uh, it's nice um, to start uh, to really go long to long time ago. Uh, Ruhl and me, actually, we met at the Sandberg Institute, that is a master institute at, in Amsterdam after the Art Academy, where we studied media design. And we did at the uh, beginning very um, yeah, experimental work. We started to VJ together and we, uh, I just wanted to, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> and we brought um, and made performances together and we brought a very funny project also here to show you very briefly. Uh, it was 2001. We always were busy with the relationship with the man and the machine and how we use technology. So that is a very interest of ours, very from a long time ago. And, um, we, at, a, at a conference in Amsterdam, we thought we want to step into the computer desktop and become little living icons. So we walked over somebody's uh, presentation uh, because we keyed ourselves on top of it. Uh, things like that. We were puppies back yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you do this when you're young, I guess, right? <laughs> so uh, we had a shared studio space uh, in Amsterdam, Rule and me. I was always very interested also with, uh, um, uh, for example, um, I made this sticker, generative sticker installation in museums all over the world, uh, which you see here. Uh, it was super nice to see what, if you give people tools, stickers, the museum visitors, how they would use them and uh, what, what would come out of it. And Rul, yeah. yeah, I was also, uh, yeah, we also did a lot of performative work where we, for example, uh, simulated the desktop or uh, video effects live for an audience uh, that then turned into music videos. Uh, that were the kind of things we were busy with. And um, we would like to also mention something that was is also quite core to our practice in 2000. 2007, we started to uh, meet up with Jonathan Paki and Edo Paulus, and the four of us, we, start, we were somehow a bit unsatisfied with the current um, field of design and art and how everybody is uh, categorized because we felt we don't fit into any category. So we coined the term conditional design. And um, that was very, uh, you could say, a successful collaboration we had that with a mentality crossing borders of film, web design, um, performance, graphic design. Yeah, and that was all before we started Monica. Yeah. yeah. So uh, in 2011, we started Monica together with Jonathan Paki. 
he stepped out of uh, Moniker five years later, and now we have a really nice studio, Ruhl and me together with um, Jolana Sukorova, that worked also on uh, Touch for Luck. And a lot. A yeah. lot, yeah. Uh, Thomas Boland and Grisha Elbe and Jay Paris. Yeah. And of course, we work with uh, Simon and Josha for the music. Yeah. And uh, Alex yeah. for the writing. Yeah, but it's good to mention this is the moment, right? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Katrin Hero. For the editing and Alexandra and Alexandra <laughs> Barankova, yeah. So this was our teams. Everybody involved it was a big team, um, yeah, for a relatively small studio. Yeah. Yeah, right. so that, yeah. So that's where we where where we are now, basically. Yeah. Right. Um. And can I ask, do you still um, stand by the conditional design manifesto that you set in those early years? And maybe how can you just uh, how would you define your practice and how has it evolved since? Yeah, I, I would say we, it's not like it's not a mantra at all, but it's something that really definitely uh, defined our our practice. It's also something that really sticks with us uh, at the moment we start projects. Uh, maybe it's nice to highlight like sort of three, uh, let's say, components or things that that came from the early days that still are uh, in the studio very apparent. Uh, one of the things is um, let's say the participational uh, part. Uh, idea and in this case we are looking to uh, what's now on the screen is called a, a work where we basically uh, ask the audience to somehow participate in like a, a rule-based um, uh, performance they get they, instructions they got instructions on their head mm -hmm. and they have to uh, we, we give them instructions and then they start behaving a certain to a certain yeah pattern uh, like a pre-described um, performative dance you could say and uh, this is a direct effect, you could say, from the conditional design, where we somehow try to define a space where something can happen within. And this uh, is always very exciting because we define like a, a space and a, and a set of rules and then something starts to happen. This, this is something that, that happens a lot. Another thing um, is called, and you, know, you could say a topic is called the whole idea of, of uh, that's basically, ah, I was, it's, mm -hmm. you know, I, we mixed up two things. Anyway. Um, the idea of this is basically, you could say, online participation, where lots of people together collaborate. Uh, in this case, we made this 3D world uh, where all kinds of um, uh, uh, clips are, or basically images, and the, the people are, the audience is asked to basically fill in these uh, empty spaces with photographs of their own, according to little photographic assignments and then together they create this world in this case about child absence epilepsy uh, maybe it goes a bit too far to completely go into that but um it's nice to see that this is a growing video that every time you watch it it's a slightly different video and you see like it's a, it's real and uh let's say a shared idea shared co-authorship of these things um yeah, maybe the last thing I like to highlight, which was not, not so much. Yeah, it's also, I think, was already apparent in our earlier works. It's like sort of a media critical uh, tendency where we somehow really like to reflect on the media that we are working in. So we, on the one hand, we are super fascinated by the technology as a, as a phenomenon, but it also always affects uh, the way we um, yeah, live, our, live our lives. And in this case, um, it's a comment on uh, like how big big corporations somehow also dictate the way we live in an uh, let's say in a nudging way yeah, yeah. yeah. it's great to see um uh, some of the past works and a really you know sense the humor uh, in them so um probably it's a perfect segue into your latest work touch for luck um there was a bit of a journey before arriving at the concept you have different um, ideas or concept before. Can you tell us how the concept of Touch for Luck came about? Yeah, uh, so this is uh, really a work that we have been working with a big team for a really long time. So it's super nice to tell a little bit more about that. Uh, we started basically, uh, uh, Thomas, what you see here on the picture as well, and me, we went to Hong Kong and uh, we got invited. We did this discovery workshop and we visited the uh, Back then, still a construction site and understood how everything works, the uh, facade, but also a lot of uh, places in Hong Kong itself. We had many uh, meetings arranged with staff members uh, of M, so there was 
in very interesting. Um, so um, the next step basically was when we back home, uh, we had the idea, well, or a starting point from M plus as well was the question that they wanted to transfer the ownership of the facade to the public. And this is a beautiful uh, thought when you have such a big facade that you say, OK, here, Hong Kong public, you also can uh, participate or in something, how it's um, going to be shaped, the facade. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and that we really liked a lot. So uh, our starting idea was, hey, how would that be if people would touch their screen and then be together be projected on the facade? We thought that it would, could be a really beautiful sensation because it, it the life aspect of it. And uh, so we had this little experiment you see here. We made also with uh, simultaneously touching. And but. What also was very important that we, I mean, as Ruhl was just explaining that we always are very uh, interested in also discussing with our work what's going on with, our, with technology and how people relate to it in their daily life. So what we observe very much in Hong Kong and anywhere in the world, in Amsterdam and wherever, is that we are constantly uh, hanging on our phone screen and I mean, uh, yeah, it's hard to let go really lots of times and we know all of this. And so uh, we thought, oh yeah, this is actually, if we want to touch the, uh, the phone and the facade, this is really something that we need to address. And um, we also figured while being there, this tradition, Chinese tradition of touching religious objects uh, for bringing luck. So we thought, hey, this is a beautiful analogy, actually, to touching your screen, your phone screen, and uh, and you think you become more lucky or more happy or it's, it's good for you. And this uh, tradition. So we were looking for um, symbols. Uh, symbols, yeah, for what, what are there that bring luck. And so the koi fish was the one that... Uh, one <laughs> that yeah. we picked it which is also really nice um that the screen is just situated at the waterfront and so it is a bit of a prolongation of the water so we made this bond and as soon as you touch your screen you turn into a fish a very naked fish at the very beginning and uh you together are slowly in, evolve slowly evolve and you're together in this bond so actually you could say that a lot of little pieces fell together in the end so we are quite happy uh, how this comes together so as you're showing here right now um on, on that slide can you go back to the previous one yeah previous slide yeah as as we, we can see here you know there are different motifs of luck as you said different symbol different motifs of luck uh, in different cultures uh, meaning there are different types of understanding a representation of luck. And in Touch for Luck, and also um, by the title itself, you're basically suggesting that digital experience or even digital addiction are a form of luck. There's obviously a sense of humor, again, uh, which is very typical um, in, in your expression. Um, it's also like it's, um, you know, a bit of an irony and the work, right? So can you explain uh, a bit more about what kind of luck is being explored here in relation to the digital? Can we simply say that our everyday digital experience is lucky or unlucky? Yeah, well, um, yeah, what is luck? Eh? I, that's, a, that's a very complicated uh, question. Um, I think at the moment we install an app normally in our lives on our phones, we somehow think that that uh, creates or basically eliminates some kind of friction that is happening in our lives. So, for example, if you install the Uber driver app, you think you will not no longer need to uh, interact with like an uh, annoying taxi driver or you don't have to negotiate fees or that kind of things. And same thing is for the navigation app or also uh, social validation in, in your platforms. Um, or automatic checkout by food delivery. So we always think, ah, it's a good feeling. And at the moment you install an app, you think, well, okay, I optimized my life somehow. And um, this is a nice feeling. We all know this and we have this uh, in our hands always. And then um, at the same time, uh, David Byrne, he made this uh, 2017 essay about eliminating humans, the human factor, basically in, in 
is an, uh, it's an, uh, an essay um, in which he described that basically every time we think we somehow optimize our lives a bit, we also eliminate a bit of the human interaction. And we also find that in our lives. And we thought that this is uh, something that we should be maybe a little bit more aware of. Um, because in the end, um, the things, the friction in our lives is also the things often what makes life worthwhile. <laughs> this is also what in the end is what makes yeah. your day your day. It's like the problems you solved or the things you did or the human interaction had to solve something. And I think that's often forgotten at, forgotten at the moment we install these apps. And this project uh, also relates to that, thematizes that a bit with a sort of wink like, you become lucky if you touch. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, um, I think um, on one hand, we have to acknowledge, you know, the convenience, um, uh, the benefits uh, brought by technology, but it's also equally important to consider and investigate into how technology impacts um, sometimes negatively our relationships and our life. So perhaps uh, now is a good time to look closer at the work because you really delved into the complexity and controversy of technology through the individual Lucky Charms. Uh, there are in total 50 Lucky Charms. Can you share some highlight charms and explain the messages being conveyed? Yeah, so um, the thing is that what you explained already you start when you enter the pond as a naked green fish and slowly you get a, a lucky charm which is a little jewelry so you become more and more decorated you could say and each charm is has a little narrative a little story in itself um but you could say that uh, actually all together are is the story yeah? so um we will show you several ones in, in general you could say what you mentioned also earlier they are related to our on social online behavior and the mechanism that are built into those online platforms that make us uh, addicted in a way to uh, being there. So um, let's uh, start with one that's called friendship. You get that quite soon. So what happens if you enter, um, you become a counter attached to your fish. So as soon as you meet a new fish, you swim over it, you can uh, count the friends that you make in the pond. After a while, you also get a friend burst, you can double them. And even later for every new friend, you get 10 new friends. So this is all about the quantification of what we do online. Uh, we quantify friends, we quantify likes and views and all these things. Um, another uh, charm is, we call it instant attraction which is when you swim along together with another uh, fish or over it, uh, you can generate little love hearts. So this is very sweet and it's also a lot of fun and refers to, um, yeah, you could say this whole online dating economy and also how attractive you are online. So you can do a, a online, uh, you, you can uh, fish dating basically. You can see it this way. It's always, as what Rul explained before, it's a little bit uh, in between, or you, uh, between, you know, making, playing with the fun and also being a bit critical. Yeah. Um, then there's uh, what you see here. The selfie time is a little camera that gets, uh, that swims along your fish. So at any moment in time, you can make a special screenshot of your fish with the the curation you have and share that with others if you like and you get teleported into a different uh, environment like the beach or the mountains and so forth so this is all about obviously our selfie culture and the vanity of you, of your looks uh, a freebie ad is another example where you get an oversized yellow arrow point arrow pointing towards uh, your fish in the whole pond um during the level you are in uh, we call it freebie ad so it's about advertising yourself and the um economy the online economy so as soon as you're visible and popular you can make money uh, there's our last example here the incognito mission we also have a little um 
bubbles in the pool that you can pop. So this is fun to do. And then all of a sudden you turn blue and this we call incognito. Obviously, you're not completely invisible, but what this refers to uh, is the idea that the more uh, start, you start becoming popular, uh, become more influential, but at one point you get also a little bit more power. And we think the more powerful you are, the, um, that you have the ability to do not being tracked or not being traced. So it's a privilege, you could say. A privilege, yes. On the other hand, it also deals a bit with, let's say, privacy concerns and that kind of stuff. Exactly, right? yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, so um, some of the charms uh, are interactive, right? So like, for instance, the, the selfie time uh, one, like people can tap on the camera and then they will be able to take a, a selfie. Um, also, I want to, I do want to highlight, uh, Luna, like I said early on, there's this uh, story, there's this narrative that's uh, sort of tethered to the individual charms and sort of threads them together. Um, um, it's, it's directly related to our um, everyday uh, digital experience or our online behavior, which starts from, uh, we, can, we, can, we might have already been able to see some uh, some of that uh, from the terms you're sharing, you know, from building an online presence, uh, gaining popularity, all the way to entering the influencer economy and increasing virility. So um, I, I do hope, you know, like people can gradually discover this narrative um, together with the multifaceted uh, messages it's, uh, and the terms. I just wanted to add that you also need some persistence, eh? so we don't make it too easy. So you really have to. Uh, uh, touch down with your finger up to three hours uh, in order to get the full story. Yeah, so it's a little bit longer than convenient. Let's put it like that. And that's by intention. Yes, yes. This is a really an endurance game. Um, and then uh, my next question is uh, really about the design. Um, there, are, there are lots of design details uh, that make uh, the movement of the fish very smooth, for instance, um, um, as we can see just now, when the fish turns, its body sort of rotates slightly. That gives a sense of dimension, also adds uh, more elegance. Um, you know, you also add a depth to the space of the pond. But compared to these 3D designs, you you actually chose pixelated emoji-like patterns for the Lucky Charms. Um, so can you tell us why such design choices? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Begin with the, um, um, yeah, no, sure. Uh, now, what I like about like the, let's say that the, um, the pixelated design and what it is for me is that it also really thematizes the digital world as a topic uh, that it really sort of addresses the fact that it's not, I mean, often like games are like trying to become as photo photorealistic as possible and therefore basically try to replicate the world or, or mimic the world. And I think in this case, we obviously chose for the pixelated thing. So you become extra aware of the fact that this is a digital uh, digital life that we're talking about. Um, this is one of the things, but mm -hmm. of course, there's multiple other things. Like, yeah, that, uh, yeah. yeah, the, the, <laughs> the we, what also inspired us about using the pixel, except what you say that it also yeah. obviously refers to this also old fashioned uh, games that um, the, the facade, the LEDs oh, yeah. are actually pixels, right? We have like 2000 by 100 or something. And um, we thought also that fits very well to this construction of the LED lamps, this grid. And uh, yeah, it refers to this, these pixels. Yeah. But also it is a nice contrast to the movement, as you mentioned. So the fish body itself is very well designed and very simple, smooth. The movement is very, yeah, smooth. And then on top of this, we have this very hard pixel shape charms. And they're all designed by, um, by Yolana, uh, which is one of the best designers of MSM. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, I guess talking about pixels, um, I feel that in deciding to make a game for your facade commission, you set yourselves quite a big challenge. On the one hand, you're working on a very small type, almost intimate sort of scale with the phone, as well as this, you know, enormous spectacular facade. Um, I'm wondering how site specific is Touch for Luck? You know, what were the cultural as well as physical considerations, if any, um, you, that shaped the development of the project? Yeah, I, um, I think this is uh, 
Um, good question. We are somehow maybe not even completely on the same uh, way of thinking, Roland and me, on, about this topic, um, because we really had the. Uh, so at first, I mean, it was important for us that this is very interesting for Hong Kong people. So people at the at the location itself that they have when you ca can influence the screen, that you can also have the relationship with the screen while standing there and playing and seeing the effect of your play. Um, but in the same time, we really wanted to have the rest of the world also be part of the experience in some way or the other. So what we have what happened now is basically a, a split. So you have the game that you can play on your uh, phone and you have the narrative of a three hour long narrative, in fact, uh, that yeah is you could see also as a separate experience in a way than the one of just seeing yourself on the screen and directly make the relationship. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is a very strong experience that uh, you would wish to have. And it would be lovely to still see a webcam somehow, but we don't have a webcam right now. And um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think I totally agree with you. I, I think the only thing what we all agree on, and it's maybe even not necessary to state, it would be so nice if you would be on like in front of the facade and could be yeah. could see our fish swimming around because that is the full uh, experience. But, yeah. but I think it's ne necessary to mention. But yeah, and it is kind there of would also, be no lockdown, yeah, that would be also exactly. good. <laughs> but you could also argue that it. Yeah, the fact that we are all doing this now online is also nice that we can now do that uh, somehow feel together and come together on this big screen while we're all in isolation, especially in Hong Kong here, it's a bit, a bit less. So it's also, uh, yeah, I think it's also beautiful in that way. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, in some of the earlier projects that you introduced, um, things like My Inner Wolf and the red, yellow, blue um, rule-based game, you seem to have this um, quite optimistic and playful sensibility. Um, it feels like the internet um, was maybe framed as this kind of space of liberation and you celebrated connectivity and participation and, um, yeah, communal experience. And... Today, while your projects like Touch for, for Luck do remain very playful, um, there is definitely a sharper edge. Um, how do you explain this change over time? Yeah, I, I think uh, also the world changed a bit in the last, let's say, two decades. When we were graduating, the, the web itself uh, was like a completely different space. There was like, it was an optimistic space where it had a very democratic um, intention everybody was like excited about like uh, sharing knowledge and, and emancipating uh, and leveling uh, the whole world basically and we were as a designer very much intrigued by that that we really wanted to somehow we felt it was also our responsibility as designers to somehow become part of that and also feel that we would be the ones to design the systems where people together could collaborate to make this better world but then we aged and the web aged and we also found out that the web is mainly um used these days it's basically sucked into the big platforms where everybody where yeah the web as a place to go to have an experience is you could say decaying and that makes us sad uh sometimes and it's also not make going to make us sad forever but it's something it's a topic that's in the forefront of our uh, practice at the moment that we want to somehow relate to that because we really believed in an open free and open web where people would together create things uh to make the world more uh equal uh, somehow we thought that, and now we see that the, the, that that is merely an infrastructure for uh, other more financial driven uh, constructions, mm -hmm. and this is why we also want to thematize that in our work every now and then. Uh, but this is not that we are going to be like preachy for the rest of our no, it's, careers. I think it's maybe also nice to mention that we, I mean, we still do this uh, platform based um, now uh, web web based artwork. And um, so it is a bit of a combination of having a critical view, but also having fun. So it's uh, always yeah. playing with those two notions. Yeah. And not the big, uh, I say, um, pointer saying, oh, it's all bad, no, what's that's happening? True. So we use it still. Huh? Yeah. And I think it's also, also only one layer of the project. It's not that that is what it is about. In the end, it's also really about the, magi the magic, the, experience. The, the magical sensation 
of like being able to somehow displace your own interactions to like a huge other world. And I think that is something completely different than like being media critical or something any mm -hmm. at all. Uh, and I think that's also, uh, but we come to that maybe later. Yeah. yeah. So I, I guess this time, like for the for the magical world you build for Touch for Luck, um, you chose to build a, a mobile phone game uh, to to express your critique on technology. Um, so can you tell us the reason of choosing that media uh, or that format? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I I um I think it's pretty straightforward. So in our work in general, also we when we take a decision, we're pretty um, consequent, you could say, and trying to follow up on all the design and whatever decisions upon this idea. And as we were talking about touch and addressing the touch, um, so it needs to be a, a uh, a telephone, uh, a mobile phone, or telephone, what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> mobile screen. Yeah. Or a, uh, yeah, iPad yeah. or a tablet. And, um, and you, so, and another very important aspect is obviously that you, it functions as a controller. So you can stand in front of the screen and play. So this is why, I mean, it makes total sense to use a mobile phone. Although we are very much aware that the desktop players that you cannot play on desktop, right? With your, on your machine, with your mouse, that wouldn't make any sense. So we exclude with this work, the participation of desktop. And that is a, yeah, this is a decision we took in favor of the play with a mobile phone on location. But at the desktop, you can now watch the whole facade. Oh yeah. So you basically can see what will be displayed on the big facade. Uh, in the desktop view, so if you go on your on your laptop or on your uh, other computer to the to the URL touchforluck.com, you will see the facade as a whole. But if you're going on your phone, you can actually swim around. So that that's basically an, also an elegant uh, division, you could say, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, like you said, in this way, people control can control their mobile phones and participate in the pond on the on the facade, um, exactly. so that it creates a a great dynamic. Um, uh, with yep. the with the Hong Kong public, um, no, so I, sorry. No, go ahead. No, oh. okay. What I want to see is what I often do is then play on my uh, mobile phone and see uh, like uh, where I control my fish. But at the same time, I also watch at the desktop, and then I see how I then you can basically navigate your swimming and then see where the other new players are. Basically, use that even as a it works very well as a co-op game or co-op like a dual screen game even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's about like building this like unique connection, uh, I guess, among screens, right? Um, so, like, um, in addition to that, what else uh, do you hope uh, players to take away from the work? I uh, yeah, that's of course like a super nice question, also important, also a difficult one for uh, us to to answer. Really, I think the moment now today where we basically uh, give this work to the audience, to to the world, it's always a bit of a vulnerable difficult moment because we basically yeah it's out of our hands and i think it's also very much i mean we have been discussing and debating all kinds of layers that are in there but i think in the end it's really about what it is uh, and it's also the poetry that is at the moment when you see it uh it's basically in the hand of the audience now and that's also the, mm -hmm. let's say the most exciting and the most um yeah um also a bit frightening uh moment for us and uh I can also imagine that different people completely have different ideas about or experiences about while doing this. Yeah. So some might come really from a tech perspective. Oh, this works really cool. It's super interesting how that works. And some other people are yeah, more from gaming or just from all kinds of different backgrounds. So yeah. I think it's totally different also. Yeah. Often what do you think only after when you do it? I'm very curious to hear. Yeah. yeah, only after a few months or so, sometimes even only after a year, you can really tell what you took away from it or what it is. We, we definitely learned a lot also about like game dynamics and about how things relate and what is a reward uh, for the investment that you made on the screen. Like everybody has to do this. And then how do we reward them? How do we keep them engaged? And there's like so much, let's say, practical things we learned, but of course also. Yeah. Um, 
more maybe poetic or artistic things yeah 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 i guess i guess i'm also like um very curious about like how people will actually get on to uh touch for luck and a dot com and also play the game um, um and also like how people co-create together you know uh, with the work on 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 the m plus facade um i think i think um we are doing really well because we have more time for Q&A. Uh, uh, and uh, we can probably look at um, the questions um, that we've been receiving from our audiences. Um, and if you haven't sent in your questions or comments, please feel free to do so. And again, in the Q&A box at the bottom right of the Zoom window. Um, We've got a couple that have come in. Um, maybe let me just see. First one, um, do you have a favourite charm and why? I think that can maybe each of you can answer that. Yeah, I can also uh, start screen sharing again. Or what do you want to do? Oh, start screen sharing again. Okay, okay do it. Shall I do it? Yeah. yeah, because we yeah. have... Uh, yeah, the, the Chrome you want to start, huh? Not, oh. Okay. Ah, the favorite charm. We have some extra. But now. Material. Okay. Yeah, but this is a, a question. question from the audience, right? Yeah, we like these things. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lula. What is your favorite? Uh... <laughs> okay. Oh, it's mine. <laughs> no, this is mine. Yeah, this is um, uh, being flagged. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What I really liked about being this is. <laughs> It's the the um, the moment is very late in the game. And then you gain the ability to flag other fish, and you swim to them and you tap on them, and then they get a, a flag. But they also they can then spread that somehow spreads throughout the whole pond after a while. And I think it's nice. It's a little bit like an um, you could say like how, yeah of a sort of viral spreading mm -hmm. of these flags. I, I like that a lot. Also because it's very rare, it doesn't happen that often. It's uh, it's very late to the game and it only happens. I'm Every not sure. I'm, say, I'm sorry. I, I'm not sure whether everybody understood that uh, at one point you get a flag that means you get a little what you see here, this red little flag. And as, as soon as you touch another flitch that they get uh, is a notification that you've been flagged. Right. Yeah. So you also wonder, oh, my God, and you cannot remove this one. So you just have it attached. Ah. Uh, we have also brought some other examples of things we like is um, um what i um i'm really curious to see what will happen actually or how that would be for people um if if you uh, lure each other into certain movements for example this little dance that you see here uh, i thought it's super fun so it's if you find somebody and then you make a certain movement and he or she joins your movement so basically what would happen if a lot of people together start to move in certain ways so i'm really wondering whether this at uh, one it could happen you know can you make a choreography together well, that goes pretty far but anyway so yeah it's so we have uh, another yeah. question yeah. we have a question from flora uh asking what's the what's your favorite or, or, or most surprising part when you uh, were doing the research trip and uh in hong kong and uh with m plus and you have to answer that mm -hmm. yeah yeah so uh, that's a very uh, tricky question because uh, um i mean to me it was so incredible impressive the Everything is so extreme. So we are living in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, where everything is small and um, kind of cleaned up and organized. And I felt in Hong Kong, it was so intense. It was huge. These skyscrapers, the how you say, call it skeletons in front of the houses the, the, to get up from bamboo. Um, how many people live on such small scale? um how they move yeah the smell the of course temperature this was super hot and uh humid 
it was all together, it was very, very intense. So it's really hard to dissect it into this or that, but it's just scale, size, quantities, it's just big, right? So that's, um, as is the screen, right? So yeah, comparing to like our little Amsterdam. Yeah, it's pretty the opposite, you could say, but I'm not sure exactly is that what the question was, what was, uh, what was more relating to the work? Just um, what's, your, what's your favorite part or the most surprising part? I think you answered part of it. I think the architecture to me yeah. is, um, it's hard to dissect as a, to see architecture separate from people. But uh, I mean, this, the visual, I mean, we're very visual people. So the, the, the skyline is just yeah. incredible. And also with the, with the colors. Yeah. yeah when i when i remember when night. you came back yeah uh, yeah that you were like very impressed about like the like the the immensity of the whole uh the mm -hmm. whole town and the immensity of the architecture and the immensity of the ambition as well mm -hmm. it was like incredible mm -hmm. yeah. right uh we've got quite a few questions coming in um from eco uh how has this project pushed your practice forward um or was there something new that you tested through touch for luck yeah i think what what is really nice now to see is like we of course start when we were for example designing all the charms with we are trying to anticipate on how users would respond to certain let's say rewards and how that would affect the game and this is you could say new territory for us we, we did like uh, sort of informal uh games earlier but this is i would say the most gamey game that we ever made and there there we learned a lot about um that yeah i mean there's already like a few things or not quite a few things that we would already if we would have like an other iteration of the project that would, would change in order to somehow create other dynamics between the players and i think there we learned so much uh that we would really be happy to make an honor, let's say iteration iteration of a world building or a world uh, populated uh, game where somehow the population of like specific set has specific uh, attributes or specific rewards or specific let's say rule set that affect each other that is really exciting and I think for example the 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 the, the sticker game that Luna made like back in the days could say is like very early work of this like how do people respond to each other in a specific, uh, in, a, in a defined uh, environment. But now uh, with things like this, it gets like, it, it can really go wild and we feel that there's like a, a huge potential there to, um, yeah, to sort out and to look into, uh, yeah. Um, so there's another question. Um, so Monica, how do you remain curious about new technologies, be active and stay relevant? Yeah, we, uh, <clears throat> I mean, on one hand, we have to also uh, uh, acknowledge that we're getting older and we have, we look at uh, what's happening uh, in the world uh, from a maybe even more reflective uh, point of view than being completely in it, as if you have like digital natives that are on their phones and on every platform all the time. And we're like, oh, wait, this is not good. Or sort of we, um, yeah, have... Uh, yeah. second thoughts about it and um so uh, yeah but on the other hand what we do here in the studio um rule and me we used to do that a while ago every tuesday we had uh, another space ex especially rented out and we had uh, conversations and we discuss and these are these can be also very uh, straightforward and about uh, technology what's going on what's in the news how we relate to it yeah. And we even filmed those, so, you know, you yeah. could say performative conversations. And, uh, and that makes us also being sharp and uh, taking decisions, going certain steps forward. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's but, really an active, you could say, we force yeah. ourselves to being. Um, yeah, that, that's maybe also in the line of what you asked earlier, like how do you evolve as an artist or as, an, as a maker uh, from like being like completely, we, we basically were, immersed in like all this new technology and we slowly also feel that we, we also we get we get we got children and we also uh, see let's say yeah we, we become more reflective as you said we have a, we had like the a, fan, a fantasy idea about like starting an um an office for screen screenless technology 
uh, there was like it was a, it's a, it's a, it's a, just a thought of what our how, what, mm -hmm. what would our practice look like if we didn't have any screens at all and that's like sort of a daring thought that's not directly like uh, will not directly translate in like action but at the same time it's like an it's a nice uh, it feels free to think about the studio as also something that could be that yeah we also would not like to limit ourselves to only online uh, participatory experiences so we really think about the whole package yeah. and then it can um, mani manifest itself on all kind of media yeah but we, we, do. we used to do a lot of also performances and films and that is something that uh, we are also both very much uh, uh, intrigued and interested in to somehow go back to that a bit every now and then um, mm -hmm. yeah right um one from frankie can you share some video games that have inspired you yeah um well i think i guess i'm the gamer here <laughs> no i think yeah it is true. so uh, one, one thing what an, an artist i uh, we, we we both really admire at here at studio is ortile he's a french artist and he made this uh like very let's say uh whimsical game uh, cookie clicker and it's an, uh, it's basically the only thing that you do have to click and uh, basically bake a cookie with every click and it's an accumulative uh bakery that in the end you basically make cookies as much as there's at atoms in the universe and this is like this weird like on the one hand it's a very let's say algorithmic uh, computerized game it's like a very much like based on one single interaction basically clicking and on the other hand it's very much about storytelling about taking you into like a specific yeah and in, into very specific a grandma that is able to bake more cookies than everybody else so there's like on the one hand stories and on the other hand very much like this core game mechanic and that is uh, nice. that was one thing that that, that, yeah. that we really like uh, i also um have to say that it's not a game but what i looked at a lot or was inspired a lot is um the more meditative um videos on youtube that you have you know, you have aquariums, but all kinds of environment yeah, yeah. that you just can look at to chill. They have specific music, sort of interesting, but also boring uh, film visuals. ASMR. <laughs> ASMR. ASMR. Yeah, exactly. Also with the sounds and uh, that, yeah, so that was very inspiring for what we wanted to make and also look for because yeah. uh, what we had in mind, what we explained for, earlier as well is something that you need really endurance so it's not only about being quick but also about staying there and breathe and you know stay a little longer and but yeah you start to suffer right at one yeah, point there's maybe also something uh, going back to the to the former question that somehow I'm, we are maybe less afraid of um, creating a bit of friction or creating a bit of uh, now yeah. hurt is maybe not or pay it's it i mean like earlier we were so much busy with optimizing everything for everybody and trying to compete with interfaces of uh instagram and 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 and, and whatsapp or whatever kind of like native apps and i think we are also like feel feel a bit more free but that's that's yeah, a different no, topic that's, uh, yeah to 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 make things that are not that so is, yeah. let's say um directly satisfying and uh, yeah that i think I don't know who came up with this term, but we really like it a lot. It's called uh, the art. We call it an art multiplayer art game. Yeah. So that also really thematizes where there is an you need some kind of investment. <laughs> it's yes? an excuse. No, no. <laughs> yeah. So that's no, it's, uh, it's it's not yeah. a typical game, right? So yeah. Um, yeah. there is the idea is that you think a little bit about what you do. If it's an art game, it can be anything, right? That's good. <laughs> it's not it's not it's not the first person shooter not, for sure no, no that's not no yeah. i guess i'm not sure if we've shared the sound yet uh with our audiences today but uh, there's a sound uh to the game so um and it's very like luna uh early on mentioned very meditative very mesmerizing so please do turn on the volume if you play the game um i think there's another Did question about from from uh Volcano pork at the beginning yeah okay yeah simon uh, Wadlesowski and Sajosha Sterlich, they made this beautiful music. Yeah, that we were Sorry, Kate, mm -hmm. continue. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, so uh, there's another question about what kind of obstacles you, have you encountered any obstacles when creating this work? <laughs> Not a single one. 
<laughs> no, I think like to be honest, it was one of the most complicated technological things that we did um, because of all the like mini games, like all the things that are happening. Yeah, it's a shame. Like Thomas has been working on this so much with the rest of the team. He has been still basically it's not completely done. There's still like little things that happen every now and then. We don't know exactly how they happen and we try to reproduce them. There's an enormous amount of obstacles. Uh, it's basically you could say uh, the project of this size is a, a bit like a few bytes too big for a studio like us, but that's also somehow how we live and what we really like to to do. It, but it was kind yeah, of but the pro not the problem. But what happened is that uh, during development we got new ideas and we got <laughs> enthusiastic and we thought, oh, but it would be wonderful if you could do this and this, and then really wanted it. And then yeah, our developer team they sort of did it, and we all all the time are in discussion with them. It's not that they do what we say at all. So they come up with feedback and together we develop further. I think it's really important to state that they, yeah. we really involve them also on a conceptual um, I think level. Involve, I think like uh, Thomas was like one of the key finders of the idea in general. Yeah. yeah. So they is, uh, they are, um, yeah, so that, that's uh, how we roll it. We have so many ideas what we wanted to implement, what we didn't, because it was at one point we had to make us st stop it, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one thing, so, for example, what we did is like uh, now the, 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 the pond can handle basically 200 simultaneous uh, visitors. But we also wanted to make sure that in case, I mean, it's not super likely, but in case there would be 500 or 2,000 people simultaneous on this screen, that it also would work. So we built this whole system on Amazon AWS, which is probably never going to be used, but maybe it is. It's already it's, it's working and it will work at the moment it is that if there's more than uh, like thousands of people, it will automatically scale up, make multiple points where uh, ponds where everybody can have a place in. And this, this is things that nobody will probably ever notice, but it has it's been made, um, it's yeah, made and it's, it's, it's in there and it will. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also like uh, nice for a project like yeah. this, that it will not fail at the moment that there's a huge interest. Great. Um, Kate, did you have any other questions? Um, I, I believe there's, yeah, I think there's one more question about the composition of the team. Uh, can you explain a bit the, role, the, the roles of the team members and how the team sort of work together uh, on this project? Yeah, I mean, uh, as I mentioned just now, we are, because we have here an office in uh, Amsterdam, and we all together very much involved in discussing all day long together with about the work. So everybody's involved. But then, of course, there are certain divisions, Wool and me, we are leading the project. And um, then there was Jolana Sukorova, that was the designer of all the charms, the elements, the, the style of it. And then there was Grisha Erbe that uh, was very much involved in the behavior. He's really good in 3D design and also motion design, but also as a creative coder, um, later continue to program and implement everything. Um, then there is Jay Paris, he's uh, very much involved in coding, which but then uh, he used Rust, that is a very low level programming language. So in order to optimize um, performance and did a lot of programming for that. And then Thomas Boland, our technical lead in the office that um, oversaw the whole technical part of the project, which was really big and also uh, did all the whole infrastructure and yeah. Yeah, I think he so really deserves like a, a huge shout out and a huge compliment because it is really incredible yeah. work. Uh, he also worked uh, like uh, over hours often in order to make everything ready for uh, for today, basically. And we are super grateful for his stamina and his uh, yeah dedication to this whole uh, project. We actually, yeah. uh, maybe that's a point in which to say that Thomas came to Hong Kong and presented as part of our 2018 conference, um, Art and Design in the Digital Realm and M Plus Matters. And it was, yeah, talking to him and hearing about all of your work that really got us excited and um, led to the invitation to come and create uh, this commission for M Plus. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess um, I think it's about time. Um, I think your, your explanation of the team sort of brings us 
it's, it's just sort of the perfect uh, remark uh, that brings us to the end of today's uh, artist talk. Um, and then I, I would also like to take the opportunity to uh, thank and congratulate Moniker and the M Plus Project team for all the hard work put into this commission. Um, I would also like to thank our audiences for joining us today. We will have additional conversations to further impact the narrative of Touch for Luck in March or April, diving into different areas of digital culture, such as video game addiction, uh, self-empowerment and community building on social media and data usage and surveillance. Uh, we will invite game designer, artist, scholar, and researcher to join the conversations. So please stay tuned uh, to announcements on our website and social media platforms. But in the meantime, um, please do visit touchforlock.com and check out the work. Um, you, you, you might find your own little fish on the Emplus facade from now on till May. Um, and actually what you're seeing right now on screen uh, is, the, is, the whole, is the full view of the pond. Um, and it, it's the pound that's currently being live streamed on the facade. Um, there was a, early on, there was a question about how to play the game. So if you go to touchforlock.com, then you will be able to join this pond. Um, we welcome and invite everybody uh, to join us in the pond after today's talk, after this talk. Um, you, obviously you can find us, uh, at least our fish uh, in the pond and play with us. There's two things I like to say. Um, one thing is that we, Kate, uh, you have been like such an incredibly uh, stable force and we want to thank you so wholeheartedly for all the uh, interactions, the prompt responses and all the, the hard work and dedication. It was really, really, we really got to learn uh, to know you as a, as a fantastic person and we are super grateful. And the other thing, I have 25 fr uh, friends on the um, facade, so that's me the, with the pink hat. Uh, I'm now starting to turn uh, rounds. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Are you, are you the one in the middle? I'm the one in the middle turning rounds now. I see. 26 uh, friends. Yeah, I, I guess I'll, I will, um, like after ending this whole, uh, this talk, I'll join the pond as well. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm, I, I'll meet you I in the pond. 66. 66. <laughs> Good. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks again, everyone, uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, so I guess we will see you next time. Uh, or in the pond, you know. Yeah, we see each other in the pond. Ah, there's like a new nice blue fish as well. Wow. That's oh, yeah. Is that possible? That's, um, that's okay, nice. Okay. Wow. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye for now. Bye. 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 <laughs>